Welcome to today's webinar, Autonorama, the Illusory Promise of High-Tech Driving, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in association with the Smart Growth Network. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth Network, supported by the US EPA's Office of Community Revitalization and managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website at smartgrowth.org that provides information on effective growth, development, and preservation practices. The website provides information to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of smart growth. This webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Maryland Department of Planning on smart growth and planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. We are recording this webinar and will be posting it on our archive on our website under the webinar archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter to learn about our upcoming webinars. You can also find out about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. The views expressed by the speaker in this webinar are those of the speaker and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning or the state of Maryland. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association and 1.5 CNUA CEU self-reported credits from the Congress for the New Urbanism. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account and search for the name of today's event, which is Autonorama, the illusory promise of high-tech driving. You can also search for event number 9227052. I would like to acknowledge our webinar partner today, Island Press, and their partnerships manager, Jen Hawes. Founded in 1984, Island Press's mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and protect the environment and to create solutions to its complex problems. So today we welcome back Peter Norton. Peter is an associate professor of history in the Department of Engineering and Society at the University of Virginia, where he teaches history of technology, social dimensions of engineering, research, and professional ethics. He is the author of Fighting Traffic, The Dawn of the Motor Age in the American City, and of Autonorama, The Illusory Promise of High-Tech driving, driving, which we'll be talking about today. Peter has published work in transportation history and policy, traffic safety, and autonomous vehicles. He is a member of the University of Virginia Center for Transportation Studies. And he's also the winner of the Hartfield Jefferson Scholars Teaching Prize and of the Trigon Engineering Society's Hutchinson Award for Dedication and Excellence in Teaching. He is a frequent speaker on the subject of sustainable and equitable urban mobility. Following his presentation, Peter will answer as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question anytime by using the questions tool located in the control panel on the right side of your screen. And as usual, we're gonna take a quick poll to get started today, and that is just asking everybody in the audience, as we usually do, where you're from today. So uh, you can see that information as well as Peter. And um, again, thank you for joining us today. If you're having any trouble with answering the poll, you may need to exit from full screen mode, and we'll keep this open for about another 30 seconds or so to give you all a chance to respond. You can see the the answers coming in now. So thanks for participating in that as well. And then we'll turn it over to Peter. Hopefully some of you were here for our Walktober walk in our um, in early October that featured a portion of Peter's um, presentation. He was one of our panelists then. Okay, we'll leave this open a second or two. Um, there's quite a distribution today. 35% of the audience is from the Mid-Atlantic or Northeast. 19% uh, is in the South, 19% is in the West, self-reported, of course, 17% in the Midwest, and 10% uh, of our audience is self-reporting as international today. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Peter Norton to get started. Welcome, Peter. Thank you very much. I uh, take a second here to share my screen, and um, I, uh, counting on uh, people in the in the hosting the meeting to tell me if I've got something wrong but I believe I have my screen up now 
And I want to thank Michael for uh, introducing this talk today. And I'm grateful to the Maryland Department of Planning and to the Smart Growth Network and to Island Press for helping to make it all um, happen uh, today. Uh, Island Press is generously offered to uh, excuse me, second, just generally off offered to offer a, a discount on my, and you can see the details there, and I'll put this slide up again at the end of the talk, because at this point, you can't know if you're, if you're interested yet or, or not. Um, I don't have time to tell you about everything in the book, so I'm going to just focus in on a few main points. Um, and the first one I want to offer to you today is that it's really important to get the distinction between a tool and a solution. I think these words are often getting used interchangeably. Very often a tool is being misrepresented as a solution because if you're selling the tool, it sounds better to call it a solution. But actually, I think there's a lot of advantages to tools in the sense that they empower the user to make choices about what to do, uh, while a solution tends to sort of come with its own answer to its own questions. You all know that the situation we're in with climate change, and this is one reason to take mobility and transportation very seriously right now. It's certainly not the only reason, but it's a good place um, to start. And while this is warning us about the future, I think there's a lot we can learn and a lot we have yet to learn still about the past. We have had emergencies before, none quite like this, but we can learn from our responses to past emergencies. For example, in 1964, as you probably know, the Surgeon General issued a report called Smoking in Health that definitively concluded, like the IPCC report reached a definitive conclusion, that smoking causes cancer and, and other life-threatening conditions. And the response to that was complicated. It's usually presented as a success story, but it took a while and the delays were deadly to tens of millions of PTSD is already very clear that smoking causes cancer. That central story received millions of uh, readers. Uh, it's from a Reader's Digest, and it was consistent also with the research already in the 50s. But there was a delay, and the delay was due to the fact that the cigarette companies, the tobacco companies, wanted to protect their market and therefore cast doubt on the validity of this research. So we know that in our in more recent history, the validity of climate change was cast into doubt by people with a material interest in selling fossil fuels. Now, in 54, they were still actually sort of admitting that they were the source of this contrarian point of view, as you can see from this excerpt. Um, the question was what to respond though, once the Surgeon General made this definitive conclusion, and this led to a second stage in the response from the tobacco companies. And it's one that I think we have a lot to learn from. Already in the 50s, when the early reports were coming out, cigarette companies were promising that their amazing filters, like Kent's Micronite filter, would sort of amazingly and magically make smoking safe. We can see that uh, the same kind of confusion is going on today when we see uh, the autonomous vehicle being sold to us as definitively better than a human driver. This is not consistent with uh, a careful review of the research, which uh, you know I've done and many others have done as well. But like cigarette filters, it is a pervasive confusion out there, right? I think we could see the analogy better if I uh, sort of hack the headline a little bit there as I've done. The was to recognize that they were at risk of losing millions of customers. And so they had to come up with promises that it was possible for cigarette smoking to be safe. And notice that the, the ad copy in these ads from the 70s are saying, or sort of explicitly recognizing that people are choosing to quit. And so this is an effort to sort of retain them on the promise that cigarette smoking can be safe. And the key to this promise is technology. Now, we wouldn't consider this cigarette filter technology particularly, or at least it's extremely simple, but it was 
exaggerated into uh, an extraordinary system that scrubs the smoke from your cigarettes so that you don't have uh, any of the carcinogens. Uh, R.J. Reynolds Company and its Doral cigarette took this to an extreme. It's got a basically a blueprint of this high-tech filter that's going to make cigarette sm smoking safe by removing the tar and the nicotine. Now, we know definitively in retrospect that these ads were, in effect, lethal because they encouraged people to think that smoking can be safe and that cigarettes, cigarette filters would make it safe. The cigarette companies, in other words, were trying to make the problem we were facing into this one. How can we make cigarette smoking safe? In retrospect, we know that that was the wrong way to frame the problem and that framing it wrongly costs tens of millions of people's lives or, or their lives were shortened by years or decades because of this misframing. What we really needed is a problem statement such as how can we minimize the risk of life-threatening diseases? And if that means quitting smoking, it turns out that actually quitting smoking, while initially very tough, in the long run, most people seem to be quite happy about the decision and not just for reasons of health. Well, we have a same kind of misframing going on, namely uh, all around us, the messaging we're getting and it's implicit messaging, which makes it harder to catch, is that our problem is how do we make car dependency work? How do we make it sustainable, safe, efficient and so on all right uh, i think we're going to have to recognize this misframing when we when we're encountering it we have to be prepared to correct it for the same reason that we had to correct the misframing that we got about cigarette smoking we need transport that's sustainable healthful affordable less exclusive and even less necessary so that we don't even have to travel sometimes um, and if we can reframe the problem that way the beauty is we have far more choices. Many of them are far less expensive, basically all of them. They can be health promoting. They can be equity promoting. Um, they can even promote livability and well-being. Uh, it's not to say that they're easy to pursue, not at all, but it is to say that our menu of choices is vastly greater when we frame the problem more correctly, um, as I'm proposing that we, we do. And as I'm also proposing that the people selling us autonomous vehicles aren't doing. I'm not saying that autonomous vehicles can't be useful. I'm saying instead that they can't be the all purpose mobility solution as ubiquitous as car dependency is today and still deliver these benefits in terms of sustainability, health and inclusivity. I inspired, and in the book I make, I apply this inspiration by Rachel Spring's 1962 bestseller, uh, Silent Spring. Um, in, in, I would even go so far as to say that that Autonorama is not a particularly original book. It's merely applying her thesis more generally. Uh, on page eight of Silent Spring, Rachel Carson wrote, "The chemical war is never won." And instead, what you get is a path of destruction in the wake of the effort to win this chemical war, namely the pesticide war against all insect pests, trying to kill them with DDT and other potent toxins. She noted correctly that natural ecosystems respond to these chemical applications in ways that defeat the purposes of those who apply them, such that you have to constantly apply more and more every year until the, the uh, toxins in the environment are so great that you'll have a silent spring, in other words, a spring without songbirds, not to mention uh, innumerable other casualties from this chemical war that cannot be won. Of course, there is a winner in the sense that the people selling the chemical pesticides win and in the terms that their market constantly grows as natural ecosystems respond in such a way that these chemical applications have to be increased. Now, I think we could take this book and apply it to our position in particularly urban transportation. And I think the fit is really a close one. People recognize Rachel Carson as having offered us urgently needed wisdom. If we apply this wisdom in urban transport, I think we can recognize that not only is the chemical war never won, the traffic war is never won either. You cannot win a war on congestion by supplying ever more road capacity. And the, the, the promise that, um, high technology is going to make this work, 
I think is specious for the same reason that the cigarette filter promise is false. It's not that those things can't be beneficial. The technology in driving certainly can be beneficial. I want to be very clear about that. But it can't make car dependency work. It can't make driving everywhere as basically the only practical choice for most people be a system that's sustainable, equitable, and efficient, right? Now, when I spoke to at Walktober uh, in October to uh, Maryland Department of Transportation, I suggested we take inspiration from this unnamed English girl uh, from a, a film produced several years ago about what happened when uh, the town of Portishead removed all its traffic lights, its curb markings, its lane paintings, and so on, to see how people responded. Would that make traffic congestion lighter? Would it make pedestrians experience better? And this girl, like all the girls around her, were walking to school when Martin Cassini, the filmmaker, asked them, what do you think about walking around in Portishead now? Are you finding that drivers are paying attention to you more? And the girl in front center said, yeah, we just have, we just went across there and a lady stopped for us, which doesn't normally happen because normally they just look at the lights. Now there's real genius here. In other words, um, that driver's intellect, that driver's intelligence was going before because the traffic lights were substituting for her intelligence. In other words, she deferred to the traffic lights and thereby didn't have much to think about. Now, um, this is a the smart growth network we're talking about. And I want to propose that we recognize that human beings are smart and we do a disservice to human intelligence when we require it to take a second billing to automated systems because automated systems are often not as smart. And this is a case in point. Uh, and this suggests to us a path toward a better mobility future because we can apply these smarts as well as apply high technology. In other words, both human intelligence and automated artificial intelligence together can deliver much more than if we depend only on automated systems alone. So I want to propose that we redefine innovation. We've been defining it as only technological and especially high-tech innovation along this spectrum. But there is a full spectrum, and that includes things like shared space on the far left where it says zero tech or as I would prefer to call it high soch because if it's high tech on the tech side it should be high soch on the social side this is an application of human intelligence of human patterns of living uh, it can be low tech and still impressive if it's high soch so yes we can have the high tech stuff and the high tech stuff can certainly have some wonderful applications it can even be useful in terms of enabling some of the high social systems but not if we have truncated innovation where it's always the technology that's supposed to deliver everything for us right so i want to conclude this introductory segment by making a really important distinction this is a distinction rachel carson was making implicitly at least in silent spring namely that a tool not uh, a tool is not a solution. So a tool enables users, the tool is low tech uh, or it can be high tech, but it enables the user, the human user. While this magic wand on the right, I'm using to symbolize the high tech delivering us effortlessly into the future that uh, the technology sales force wants us to have. Uh, I, I think there's a wonderful word of wisdom about this phenomenon and it comes from the electrical engineer who wrote most of the screenplay in 1968 for 2001 A Space Odyssey. You probably, or you may recognize that I'm referring to Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, in a 1968 letter to the editor of Science, he said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. This is an engineer saying this. I wanna be very clear about that. And by this he means it makes us recognize or imagine possibilities that we have grown up thinking were impossible. So 2001 A Space Odyssey as the cover of, or, or as this poster indicates was depicting things delivered by technology that were hard to imagine then and frankly even rather hard to imagine now. Well it's this effect of high tech of appearing magical that gives credibility to people who are promising anything 
to us in the hope that we will then buy it. We see, for example, uh, ZF, a company here promising that uh, automated driving will deliver us efficient mobility. Um, it's worth noting that this 2020 advertisement comes from the same company, it's really the, the descendant company in this case, that released this ad on the left in 1958. In both cases, they're promising autonomous vehicles. Uh, and in both cases, they're trying to make us think that these are credible in the near future. And yet the, uh, the ad on, on the left is 63 years old. The ad on the right is one year old. In other words, the promises are still elusive. Yes, in some ways there's been in, impressive steps toward fulfilling the vision on the right, but we're very far from there. And it's not clear that the effort to get there is worth it. Uh, experts say, and I'm deferring to them on this, that about $100 billion has been invested in the 21st century on autonomous vehicles. And it's, to me, it's disturbing to think about what that might have delivered applied to things we already know how to do. All right. These, as you know, have been ma ma being made for a long time. They haven't been fulfilled. Nissan promising in 2000. 13 that will have autonomous drive vehicles by 2020. Uh, we have uh, the CEO of Aurora saying that he won't need, his, his sons won't need a driver's license uh, after 2020. This is six years ago that he's expecting this. Uh, I'm not criticizing him because he was in very good company and making these kind of casts. The Guardian had this forecast that from 2020, we would be permanently backseat drivers because robots would be driving our vehicles for us. This is just six years ago. So um, one way of responding to this is to say, well, the, the, the advancements have been a little slower than we expected, but let's keep you know, trying because the benefits are really extraordinary here. I want to suggest that actually the problem, like the problem with the cigarette, is not a problem of developing the right cigarette filter. It's a problem with smoking itself. Only in this case, the problem, it's not cars, the problem is car dependency itself, uh, is not something we can make work, uh, not if we want sustainability, health, uh, efficiency, inclusivity, affordability, and so on, right? So these promises were you know, extremely common and universally wrong, right? So uh, there's a history to this. Futurama One, I think uh, you've heard of it. It was an exhibit at the 1939 to 40 New York World's Fair. It was produced by General Motors. They got the word from combining the word future with the word diorama because they had an enormous model of this future. At that time, that future was, the, uh, was 1960. And they had a, a catchphrase for this, there will always be new horizons. It's an interesting catchphrase, catchphrase because you know what a horizon does is you approach it. As you approach a horizon, it recedes, which means you never quite get to this uh, oasis that turns out to be a mirage that you're pursuing but never quite reaching. But in the effort to reach it, of course, you, you will buy, and this is General Motors' uh, take on it, you will buy a lot of stuff to get there. It's so a transformation from General, I'm sorry, from Ford's vision, that's Henry Ford with his Model T, Henry Ford's notion, it was the old fashioned notion of, of entrepreneurship, is, which is you make a reliable product uh, at a good price that will last, and you will win customers by satisfying your customers. General Motors in the 1920s already developed what was a much more successful approach from a business point of view, and that is don't keep the customer satisfied, rather keep the customer dissatisfied. This is Charles Kettering, an electrical engineer at General Motors. He was basically number two there. And in 1929, he wrote an article called Keep the Consumer Dissatisfied, and they will keep buying in the same way that a person who is dissatisfied because that oasis they're approaching in the desert keeps receding will keep going in that direction, even if in the end there is no oasis there at all and it's just a mirage, right? So uh, this is really one that you could call it the manifesto of consumerism and it comes from uh, the automobile sector. 
General Motors developed this thesis. I want to stress it wasn't just General Motors alone, Ford Motor Company, many others in what was then called Motordom were involved in this. Motor, uh, General Motors was just more inventive and more imaginative in applying this. There will always be new horizons. This is a phrase they used a lot. And promises of a future, say 20 years from then, where driving would be efficient, congestion-free, uh, and safe. Um, they invoked experts who were willing to say things like divided highways with grade-separated interchanges and shoulders and median strips would make crashes impossible. Now, we know that's not true because we've had 70 years of experience with divided highways. Uh, we know that actually they invite certain kinds of uh, fatal uh, incidents that other kinds of roads don't. But that was not known in 1934 when this article was was promised now or was written. Well, I think we've got the same thing going on with the promises we have now. We don't know yet that those promises won't stand up, which gives them a chance to be credible. Uh, Shell Oil Company is asking us to imagine a future city where everybody drives everywhere at any time without delay and parks for free when they get there. Uh, but it was General Motors that really took this idea they added to this mix of of uh, engineering in terms of highways electrical engineering too they said that radios uh, which could enable these things like magic brains in other words the car could make decisions in response to its environment thanks to radio electronics this was part of that vision too and they uh probably very elaborately at the 1939 to 40 new york world's fair where the General Motors exhibit, Futurama, was by far the most popular exhibit there. It was so lavish, so spectacular. When you went in, you looked down on the city of the future as if you were looking at it from a, the window of an airplane. You kind of passed by on a moving chair, looking down at this city. Now, uh, this city did not turn out to quite look that way. Pursuing this city, actually creating effects like this. This is Portland, Oregon in 1962. So note that the picture on the left is supposed to be the city of 1960. The picture on the right is actually the city of 1962. And of course, if you funnel unlimited numbers of motor vehicles into a city, while you're also depriving people of useful alternatives, this is what you can expect to get. And this is what we have inherited. So future Rama 1 by 1960 was actually looking like something of a failure right the the promise of congestion free driving as you see here from a portland cement association advertisement from 1948 meant urban destruction on a enormous scale this is the african-american neighborhood of detroit uh, called paradise valley hastings street was its main street it was vibrant most people who lived in this area did not even drive a car at all they didn't need an expressway uh, they had to live here too because of residential housing segregation uh, in the suburbs uh, you know that was ubiquitous um that in that pursuit that pursuit of futurama one trying to make that real delivered the chrysler freeway on the right which today is being proposed for removal but not after it caused unfathomable destruction uh, this is the same view by the way you might recognize a church steeple uh, on the left that's the same one on the right um, this is a this is devastation pursued in the name of an elusive pseudo utopia, uh, and I fear that we are uh, being promised the same kind of pseudo utopia today. Now, because of that kind of destruction, uh, highways were much more controversial even in the late 50s and early 60s than we seem to remember. Okay, and that meant that there had to be a second wave of promises because the first wave was proving to be a disappointment. Uh, it was a disappointment because of disappointment. Books like Jane Jacobs' Death and Life of Great American Cities were bestsellers because people recognized that this vision of a planned city that's also car dependent wasn't working, was very destructive. And uh, you know, this was some very bad press for people who wanted a future of car dependent cities. And if you remember Arthur C. Clarke's comparison of state-of-the-art technology with magic, well, that's the answer. So magic circa 1960 meant transistors. It meant the electronic age. 
It meant that if you could connect your vision of the future with state-of-the-art technology, you could promise almost anything because the technology was so impressive, it almost seemed like magic. It wasn't ever really clear how transistors were supposed to deliver this. There were some significant and impressive experiments to automate cars with transistors. Um, but uh, you know, it, it was a long stretch to claim that this would make car dependency work. But that was the promise, as you can see here. Um, this promise, incidentally, is coming from the government of the state of Pennsylvania. So this promise was being sold to government. Here they're promising an electronic highway. They're promising a jam-proof expressway, an expressway where cars don't crash, where there's no traffic congestion because of electronics. And electronics has just enough aura of magic that this seemed credible, right? Um, so uh, these these um, this news item on the left and this advertisement on the right are promising the electronic car of tomorrow empowered by transistors will drive itself. You'll have no more crashes, no more traffic jams somehow, thanks to these things. Walt Disney made a famous TV episode as one of its uh, Sunday TV, uh, weekly TV series, uh, Disneyland. It put together a cartoon about this, Magic Highway USA. Uh, it was uh, developed in consultation with interest groups promoting highway construction. Uh, and Magic Highway USA was developed further into what was called Futurama 2. General Motors opened an exhibit again at the New York World's Fair of 1964, so it's 25 years later, 25 years after Futurama 1, I mean, and 25 years after Futurama 1, it opened Futurama 2, that's what it called it, and it was at the exact same location as Futurama 1, uh, namely Flushing and Queens, and they're making the same kind of promises. And you might ought to wonder, well, then why would people believe it? It wasn't true before, why would it be true now? It is, again, the invoking of state-of-the-art technology, which is truly impressive, to justify any promise, no matter how far-fetched. Ford was involved, too, at its Wonder Rotunda. Uh, they, they had uh, an exhibit where people could sit in Ford convertibles that were pulled along a track, so they were, in effect, driverless cars. It was a complete, of course, um, um, simulation of what it would like to be to what it would be like to be in a driverless car. Visitors to uh, Ford's Wonder Rotunda, which is what they called it, could sit on the Magic Skyway ride, sitting in a Ford convertible that was pulled on a track uh, so that there was no driver. And it felt like the driverless car future that Ford and General Motors were selling to us. It was an elaborate ride. You were sitting in a real car that always kept moving. You even stepped into it while it was moving uh, very slowly. Uh, and in it, the culminating point of this ride, here you see people getting on the vehicle with the help of yellow jacketed assistants. Uh, it was a chance to feel like you were in a driverless car, which is a way of making a driverless car future seem credible. Uh, the, the technology in here was very impressive. You were supposed to be driving around under the sea as well. Here's a highway interchange under the ocean. It culminated, the Ford ex exhibit uh, culminated in Space City, which was the super high-tech city of the future, just like Futurama 1 ended in a city of the future. General Motors had a similar exhibit. This is the one they actually called Futurama 2. Those are parking garages on the left. By then they realized you gotta have parking for all these and their answer was parking skyscrapers all over the city. This was supposed to work all thanks to transistors again. No traffic jams, no crashes. So this promise too ultimately was disappointing too. Um, and that meant that there was a necessity for a future Rama 3. And as you can see in, in this quotation, we're converting our defense electronics to create smart highways for tomorrow. This was not built for us, but rather envisioned for us with the effort of selling it to us substantially by the defense, the military contractors, the weapons makers, um, because it came in the 1980s. And as the Cold War wound down in the late 80s, they were looking for new customers. Now, it took a while to get there. Uh, namely, Futurama 2 had to fail first 
you've probably heard of the Freeway Revolt. Uh, and um, here's an example from Philadelphia. Alice Lipscomb's protest there actually succeeded. The Crosstown Expressway, which would have gone through her neighborhood of Philadelphia, was fortunately never built. Um, you can see also new environmental values growing in part due to Rachel Carson's book. Here is the first Earth Day where Fifth Avenue in New York was made pedestrians only. A lot of people thought, hey, maybe this is the future, not Futurama. Um, there was a credibility gap, in other words, that really ultimately defeated Futurama too. And that meant for those who wanted to sell us a car dependent future, they really needed to come up with Futurama 3. And that would, of course, be based on the most impressive technology of that time. By now, we're talking about the 1980s, and that's the microprocessor. Intel made the first microprocessor in 1971, the Intel 4004. Like the transistor, it was incredibly impressive. This time, it's basically a computer on a chip, and this was going to make the unkept promises of the previous Futuramas keepable, and they were going to be made again. There's a really important point I've got to make here, which is these things were coming with remarkable regularity. Futurama 1, 1940. Futurama 2, 25 years later. Futurama 3 is building up speed uh, 25 years after that. The technology truly was impressive. It was microprocessors that put computers into the homes of millions of Americans. This Apple computer would be the first time many people experienced a mouse and a, and a user interface that was not too intimidating and, and useful. And that was all made possible by microprocessors. Uh, General Motors put together an exhibit again, this time at the Epcot Center at, at Disney World in Florida depicting the future that microprocessors were going to deliver or supposed to deliver at this exhibit called World of Motion, which basically copied Ford's uh, 1964 exhibit at the New York World's Fair. It was quite similar. It culminated like that one did in a high-tech vision of the city of the future, uh, which they called Center Core. And they were deliberately making the city of the future look like the interior of a microprocessor because of the fact that the microprocessor invoked that magic that Arthur C. Clarke spoke of back in 1968 when he said that state-of-the-art technology is, in terms of its impressions, indistinguishable from magic. Right? Now, as the uh, 80s continued and the Cold War and Cold War uh, wound down and Gorbachev became a president of the USSR and the Cold War came to an end, America's weapons makers were quite anxious about what their market was going to be like. And almost in the nick of time, the Gulf War of 1990 to 91 happened. And at, in the Gulf War, state-of-the-art technology, microprocessors, lasers, um, and so on, uh, put on a, a show that impressed a lot of people, right? Here, some of you will remember the press briefings in Saudi Arabia, that's General Schwarzkopf, with a TV monitor to his left there. And on that TV monitor, as some of you already know what he's going to show. He was going to show you like this. These were called smart bombs. And this is really the beginning of the word smart as an adjective proliferating. Uh, in the technology sense of the word. Now, it had been used before, but it was the Gulf War that made this an everyday term when pe people hadn't really heard of smart systems, so-called, uh, before. But by 1991, by January 1991, uh, the, this usage of the word smart as an adjective to apply to high-tech systems was everywhere. And it was because of this, this was free publicity for the uh, high-tech companies and the weapons contract. And after the war, they immediately began saying, we're going to sell this stuff to defeat highway congestion. They were really frightened. They were explicit about this. They went to Congress about this, and they said, we don't know what our future's like, because presumably the Pentagon's going to start spending a lot less money on weapons, and that's our bread and butter. So as you can see, these military contractors like Lockheed like Rockwell, are saying we are going to uh, convert our defense electronics to create the smart highways for tomorrow. 
We're going to develop transportation systems that eliminate highway congestion, reduce pollution, and increase safety. Right? Rockwell battles gridlock with military technology. Now, this was never called Futurama 3, but because they're promising everything that was promised in Futurama 1 and Futurama 2, and because they're promising that it's high tech that's going to make it possible, it seems to me that this 1990s effort to sell us smart highways is really justifiably called Futurama 3. So I've, I've elected to give it that name, even though it was never actually called that. How is it supposed to work? Well, there would be hardware embedded into highways, uh, sensors in the vehicles, networks of digital connections, microprocessors, of course, in every step of the way. And this was supposed to make this congestion-free safe highway happen. It never did. Of course, a lot of these smart systems were developed. They gave us things like variable message signs that tell us about congestion up ahead. They contributed to uh, GPS systems, although those were mostly developed by the military themselves. Uh, but they never delivered anything remotely like what you see here. Uh, today, driving on an interstate highway is still substantially uh, a manual operation with some technology in the vehicle to assist. But in 1997, this culminated in a demonstration of what the technology can do. This test driver is holding both hands up to show that his hands are not on the steering wheel. His car is being steered automatically by some very expensive technology that's following magnets embedded in the center of this road in California. This was called Demo 97. Um, you can see on the bottom left of this uh, uh, poster uh, what it was supposed to deliver. This is supposed to be congestion relief and safety by permitting vehicles to drive at speed closely spaced, which would be a more efficient use of road space. Also supposedly safer because these vehicles would all be sort of automatically, um, the speed would be automated in them, right? In effect, what's happening here, of course, is that an extremely inefficient train is being invent, reinvented, uh, e each train car, in this case, having one or two people in it instead of uh, 20 or 50. Um, but th this Demo 97, again, was a disappointment uh, to the general public, at least, even if the people promoting it called it a success. And so you can predict what that means. It's going to take a future for. Here's a look at scenario. A lot of people pointed out immediately that even if this works, incidentally, you can see hands sticking out of the windows to show that their hands are not on the steering wheel. But even if this works, of course, what happens when they all exit the highway to go to their downtown business locations? Of course, they'll be backed up at the exit ramps right back onto the highways. So this was not a terribly convincing demonstration. This meant, of course, there would have to be a Futurama 4 in which whatever is the state-of-the-art technology of more recent decades would have to be the thing that makes broken promises credible again and repeatable again. Now, there were, of course, after the disappointment of Demo 97 and the disappointment of Futurama 3 and Smart Highways, visions for something else, right? So Jeanette Sadakan in New York City says, you know, why don't we try bus rapid transit, uh, bike lanes, walkability. Um, in other words, there's a lot of ways we can improve efficiency, equity, affordability, health, and environmental sustainability, and they don't all have to be high tech. And this vision, of course, we still have with us and we haven't lost it, but it's competing with another vision being made credible by amazing things like, for example, the smartphone. Here's an ad for the very first one uh, in 2007. The iPhone, I mean, the very first iPhone, I should say, in 2007. And the incredible capacities of these things uh, gives people, um, or, or lends the technology, I should say, a credibility that it could do almost anything, right? Um, and, and so at the same time, although the Cold War ebbed for a bit, after the Gulf War, it never really went away again, and the military contractors can see opportunity here again. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, an office of the Department of Defense, says we're going to need some high-tech stuff to fight the terrorist threat. Uh, in particular, the Defense Department is interested in autonomous ground vehicle technology. 
um, this is 2006, they're saying this, they say one third of the operational ground vehicles uh, in the Pentagon should be autonomous by 2015. Of course, there's, you know, it's not even 1% if it's that. Uh, and to start this off, they offered a $2 million prize to anybody who could develop an autonomous vehicle that could complete um, a desert test track, right? This Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency's announcement of the grand challenge, $2 million to the winner. Winner uh, in 2005 at this grand challenge was uh, Stanford's Stanley vehicle, a Volkswagen with a whole lot of high-tech equipment on it. And this impressive uh, stunt, uh, this impressive feat, uh, got the attention of tech companies and automakers. For one thing, they knew they could have a deep-pocketed market in the form of the Defense Department, which would pay a lot of money. Um, but that, in turn, could be um, generalized into a consumer market as well. Uh, this is how Stanley was sensing the environment um, and navigating around in it. Of course, still standing an old-fashioned internal combustion engine, early 20th century, so to speak, vehicle, but now rigged out with some very ex expensive high-tech stuff, lidar for sensor for sensing the environment, cameras, radar, um, and of course uh, a lot of computer processing power as well. General Motors was inspired by these DARPA grand challenges. And in 2010, it came up with something that really must be called Futurama 4. It didn't call it that. But it teamed up with its Chinese partner because China was going in big for automobiles at this time. General Motors saw a big market there. China did not permit General Motors to take this market alone. It had to find a Chinese partner. It did in the form of the Shanghai Automotive Industries Corporation called SAIC, S-A-I-C. And they teamed up in 2010 on a vision of the Shanghai of 2030. I think you can spot right away the similarities with the old Futuramas. Namely, they're showing the city of 20 years in the future, just like they did at Futurama 1. And they're showing it again at a World's Fair. This time it was Shanghai's Expo 2010 held in this exhibit hall, um, where now instead of a model, they use a digital video uh, to show off the city of 2030. Now this is in 2010, so of course at this point, we are now more than halfway toward this vision of the car paradise of 2030 delivered by state-of-the-art technology. I think you can also recognize the similarity of the pavilions between Ford's at the World's Fair of 64, General Motors at uh, Epcot Center in Florida, it's um, consistently, some have compared these to tires lying on their sides, that might be coincidence, but these are all selling us futures. Uh, and it, you know, the question before us is, do we buy again? Do we buy this future a fourth time uh, or a fifth time uh, if, if it comes to that? As people entered the GM psych exhibit in Shanghai in 2010, they were told that they were looking at the city of 20 years in the future, that is the, the Shanghai of 2030, which would be free from emissions, free from petroleum, free from congestion, free from crashes, all brought to, brought to, to us by the state-of-the-art technology that GM and Psyche and other tech companies had, had to offer. An enormous uh, film screen there and this film called 2030 Xing was depicted. It was the uh, Shanghai of 2030. Uh, and it shows a completely car dependent city. Yes, there are places where people walk, but to get anywhere, everybody gets in a car. There's also some high tech uh, uh, trains too, um, but it's mostly people getting around in cars. Um, on the bottom, you can see that windmills are supposed to make all this possible, wind turbines. Um, in the center, there's even a photosynthesis car it's supposed to convert CO2 in the atmosphere uh, into energy to propel the vehicle. It's got a kind of giant synthetic leaf on top. Um, and this, this vision of the future was presented as carbon neutral and a car paradise, extremely energy intensive, but somehow also carbon neutral. I don't think I have to tell this audience that it doesn't add up, but this is the future being sold, right? 
also a future in which everybody in the vehicles would be constantly connected, constantly generating monetizable data. And this was going to help make this cost effective for uh, the companies involved. So here's a, a vehicle occupant who doesn't have to pay attention to the road anymore and therefore can be engaged in social media instead of engaged in the job of driving, opening up an enormous new frontier in data collection because right now, the two biggest impediments to data collection from phone users is when they're sleeping and when they're driving. Of course, a lot of people still generate data when they're driving, but you know, ideally they are not, but this would completely open up that, that frontier collection. This Futurama 4, and again, it was never called Futurama 4, but I think it in effect is Futurama 4 or Autonorama is a lot like previous generations of Futurama. I, I think these pictures are almost, or they're just remarkably similar in what they're invoking here. Uh, and um, they're, they're making claims that are not credible, but the technology of their day is supposed to make it credible, right? So General Motors in 2017 issued a sustainability report. In that sustainability report, it said, we're gonna apply this technology to deliver zero crashes, zero emissions, and zero congestion. They're still making this promise. Uh, they now call them three zeros. It's a regular promise made at General Motors forums. Uh, I'm not picking on General Motors because, of course, very similar promises are made by tech companies and automakers. Uh, too, too many to count, right? Again, General Motors, to give them due credit, has been more uh, uh, sort of explicit and daring about this than most companies have been. This is the promise they made in 2017. It's exactly the same as the one they're making today. They made it, for example, at the 2021 Consumer Electronics Show. This is, in the soul, this is some of the promotional imagery. It shows, again, car dependency overwhelmingly. Dependence that works somehow. Exactly how is never made entirely clear. Uh, cars typically predominate in these visions. These visions uh, are being sold in part to the people who are, are making them happen as opportunities for massive data collection, right? One of the questions that gets raised is why would an automaker want driverless cars? Because then, you know, people could summon a car with their phone instead of buying their own. Well, a compensation for any loss in, in market due, due to that effect would be the fact that once people are in vehicles, they would be generating monetizable data. Intel, the chip manufacturer, recognized this in 2016 when they were promising, and this is not an expression they invented, but they, they adopted it, data is the new oil. People in vehicles will be generating vastly more data than they do otherwise, and certainly than they do in a conventional car. And they're promising that the auto companies that partner with them will get a share of this monetizable data. Uh, and uh, that will make this a very profitable venture for those who get involved in it. Now, when I wrote the book, Autonorama, I didn't really anticipate that General Motors would deliberately invoke Futurama 1 in selling Futurama 4, but they now are. So quite recently, within the last year, year and a half, they've been selling a vision of 2039, sometimes referring to it as Futurama 2.0. Now, of course, they called their own exhibit at the New York World's Fair of 1964, Futurama 2. So I think we really ought to call it Futurama 4. But they're saying 100 years after Futurama 1, we will finally make this vision come true in this new version of the city of 20 years into the future. It's always 20 years in the future a high tech city where technology makes, lets every people, I'm sorry, lets everybody drive everywhere at any time and park for free when they get there without delay and without crashes, right? So this is a, now we're talking 2020, General Motors is promising again, a future without congestion. You can see in this imagery, it's because of technology, right? They're promising that people in vehicles would be engaged online generating data, right? So this person in a autonomous vehicle is uh, having a phone conversation, uh, which is of course generating data. The better way to generate data is by media entertainment. So they're promising that vehicles will be rigged out 
people will be generating data that they would not be generating if they had to drive the car. This will make the car a source of lucrative, monetizable data. Uh, entertainment will be everywhere. Screens will be everywhere in these vehicles. Um, even, even the shared vehicles like this one, this is still uh, General Motors' uh, vision of 2039 now. And in the 2021 Consumer Electronics Show, uh, having to go virtual, they developed this exhibit zero, zero congestion, zero collisions, uh, zero emissions. This is the promise. Uh, and in this exhibit, they are quite clear that they say that data generation is going to be a big part of this, right? So in this part of that 2021 exhibit of General Motors, they're saying that people will enjoy nights out without ever leaving the car. Right, because it'll be so entertaining to be in the car. The car will just circle around while they enjoy all the amazing entertainment systems. I don't think I need to say how disturbing this is to contemplate in terms of vehicle miles of travel, congestion, emissions, energy consumption. Yes, the vehicles are supposed to be electric, but yes, the electric power has to be generated. That generation of electric power has to come from somewhere. If we're going to increase the share of sustainable energy in the energy grid, we're going to have to also reduce demand on the grid, not increase it substantially. So this is why uh, the autonomous vehicle future that's being sold to us, one of the reasons why, why it can't be what is being promised uh, to us. So I'm going to conclude by proposing how we escape from Futurama. I can only do this very briefly. There's much more to it than I have time to offer. But let me at least make a couple of suggestions. So we have to question these versions of the future that are being sold to us by these consultancies. Uh, it's ubiquitous as the covers of their own reports indicate this is not about people getting around in sustainable ways um, or affordable ways either. We have to question these uh, visions that are being sold to us. Uh, there was a an amazing report released uh, last fall, uh, about a year ago, um, that in which uh, 346 transport experts uh, were surveyed and they said, you know, this is not the future that we need. What we need really is a future of public transportation, walking, cycling, uh, and we can make the public transportation more sustainable. Uh, we can use state-of-the-art technology to make this work. We can use state-of-the-art technology to give people um, you know, access to bikes at train stations. These are the things we can do with full spectrum innovation that includes high tech, but also high social innovation as well. We have to be the ones who use these things as tools rather than passively accepting them as solutions though, right? Now, to me, the Netherlands has set this example already. I was a guest professor there in 2018 and 19. And as many of you know, the Netherlands had a kind of rebellion against car dependency back in the 70s. This is from a poster made in the Netherlands in 1979 by a citizens group, by advocates. And it demonstrates the spatial requirements of being in a car compared to being in practically everything else. And this is a way of showing that, you know, what the experts even are selling to us or presenting to us and what the companies are selling to us can be questioned. Um, in the Netherlands, it was really substantially popular demand combined with expert support by that fraction of experts who were in agreement with this uh, popular movement that delivered a, this to us. I think you, many of you know that there was in effect a rebellion in the Netherlands circa 1970 to demand better. What's not nearly so well known is that this happened in the USA as well, all over America, 20 years earlier, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, there were people power movements demanding walkability, demanding slow vehicles, demanding um, shared space, demanding safe access to streets for children, um, demanding really everything we need to have a sustainable transport future. I just have time to show you the one picture from Philadelphia, but I have an, a large collection of these kinds of pictures and they happen in all kinds of cities, large and small, in communities of color, in white communities, in um, really uh, suburbs even were, were these rebellions. And they ultimately 
surrendered to car dependency by about the 1980s, which is incidentally about when things like the minivan really replaced uh, walking for uh, children in, in urban America. Now for the Netherlands, this was not only a mobility boon and a sustainability boon, it was also a safety boon. Here you see traffic fatalities in the Netherlands as it was adopting the car from 1950 to 1970. 1970 was about when they had this rebellion demanding cycling, demanding walkability and demanding transit and demanding that cars not dominate everywhere. And the result of that revolution was a sharp drop in traffic deaths as well. So if you want safety, in promote walkability. If you want safety, promote cycling. Um, this is the lesson that the Netherlands has to, to offer us, right? So today, um, the USA is three times worse in terms of its traffic deaths per 100,000 people, while back in 1970, they were getting, they were almost comparable, right? Why don't we learn from this example? Uh, this is an example we can more easily study than ever. This particular video was just released a couple of weeks ago. I recommend it to you as one of many ways to learn about how the Netherlands makes its urban mobility safe and sustainable and inclusive and affordable. Uh, as, and it comes ultimately from not mistaking a tool for a solution. A tool is not a solution. The automobile was originally sold as a special purpose mobility tool. It was repackaged by the late 20s as an all-purpose mobility solution, which it was never really suited to do. The technology was supposed to make it credible as an all-purpose technology or all-purpose mobility solution. It still isn't working because of the fundamental limitations of the car itself. That is, it demands a lot of energy to move it. It demands a lot of space. Uh, it also makes all other ways of getting around harder. The more you accommodate driving, the harder it is to accommodate everything else. And that's true even if you automate vehicles, right? So I want to propose that we reconceptualize or rediscover innovation as including high-tech innovation, but also including zero-tech and low-tech innovation or high social innovation, the innovation that puts to work the incredible intelligence of human beings that are capable of things the latest in machine learning still can't match. Um, let's not mistake tools for solutions and let's question the people who wanna sell us things that they choose to call solutions. Let us rather find the tools we need to make the future um, we want. It does not have to be all high tech, it can be various versions of mixed tech, like this electric bike that lets people bike even in steep hills or lets people bike even if they aren't particularly physically fit, um, right? It can mean technology can make trans transit work better. Uh, technology doesn't have to be involved at all if we just permit, for example, a grocery store to open in the middle of a single family residence neighborhood, which lets people walk and bike to it, something that's not now permitted in residential America or, or a large fraction of it where you can't really walk anywhere and that it's actually been made in effect illegal to do anything but drive because of the fact that the zoning makes everything out of reach to you. I mean this this would be a way that people of all points along the political spectrum ought to see value in because it includes things like deregulation rather than regulation. It's not expensive to reimagine this either lifting zoning restrictions has been done in Minneapolis where it's been well received and also some other places as well. Finally, it can mean uh, putting to work the incredible smarts. You know, people talk about smart cities, smart mobility. The ultimate in smarts is still a human being. We need technology that lets those smarts find beneficial application as it does in Portishead, England, as this example illustrated, which, which signifies the fact that a really smart mobility future is one where state-of-the-art technology is put to work where it's useful, but human smarts are as well, as is happening right now in Portis said. So uh, I'm going to conclude there with, uh, I repeat the slide that uh, Island Press uh, uh, put together where they're offering a 30% discount on the book. I want to thank you for your attention and for your interest. 
I thank the Smart Growth Network and the Maryland Department of Planning and Island Press again for putting this event together. And with that, I will turn the uh, room over to uh, our hosts. Great, thank you, Peter. And we'll ask you to turn on your camera right now uh, so we can see okay. you while we're doing the Q&A. And uh, thanks to everybody who's submitted questions. I will say we've gotten quite a number of them and we've also gotten quite a number of comments. So some of these are a little bit longer because of the thoughtful uh, presentation you had today. So we'll kind of combine comments to respond to as well as questions as, as part of this. And you can continue and if you're in the audience to send them in uh, through till 2.30. Um, so I'm gonna start kind of at the end here with a couple questions that came in as you were wrapping up. And I, and I guess the first one will be a comment here from Eric Hawkins, who says, it's interesting to see how the renderings from Futurama 1 and 2 showed multiple passengers in the automated vehicles, and the renderings from 2010 only show one person in each vehicle. It's now a foregone conclusion that everyone has a right to their own vehicle. I, and I'm surprised they're not showing children riding to school in autonomous cars by themselves. Is that, is that something you've noticed as well? Well, in fact, they are promising that this will be children's way of getting around. There, there's the, the messaging from the people selling us this future is that the, one of the benefits of autonomous vehicles is that children will be able to get where they have to go without being taxied around by a parent, which, um, I mean, to me, as a parent, it sounds dystopian, but you know, it, it's, it is actually being presented seriously as, as a way of, of providing mobility. Um, it, to be fair to the people selling it, this future to us, there are a growing number of visions that show people sharing, meaning multiple people in the same vehicle, um, as you saw in one of the, the GM uh, depictions of the city of 2039, you may remember seeing four people in a vehicle. So there is some of that going on, but it's actually with the hope that people will end up being in that vehicle longer because of the entertainment or the working systems that so you can you know, do office work or something that will be generating data as well. But that, that's a, a great observation uh, that that uh, audience member had to offer. Hey, thanks, Peter. Uh, next one here is a, a similar question from Corey Pitts, who's asking, how do we market or sell an alternative future that includes fewer cars when the other side has a lot of resources to market their future? I would argue that this is why Futurama continues to persist. Well, I, I think that's exactly right. In fact, um, the Futuramas, particularly in the 20th century, they came from an era where to put on an impressive show was not something most people could do. You had to be well connected, you had to have a big budget and so on. And I could only show a tiny fraction of the promotions. They were also on television, they were in films, they were you know, giant models, world's fairs, and ordinary people couldn't really put up a comparable presentation. Incidentally, a lot of people have concluded from that that there weren't skeptics at the time, that this skepticism is something we've acquired recently. And I hasten to stress that the skepticism was always there. It just never had a stage, anything like the stage that the uh, sellers of Futuramas had to offer. But to get to the question about what we can do today, I mean, there, there are some really wonderful examples of inexpensive things that do get a lot of attention. Um, I, I hesitate to offer examples because I don't want to leave people out, but I, I feel I should offer an example. Take street films, for example. Um, I think most of those are, are made by Clarence Eckerson. I'm not sure if he makes them all, but these are short videos that show us what's possible. It's, it's through those that a lot of people learn, for example, how cities in the Netherlands can achieve things like 50% of passenger transportation that's on a vehicle is on a bike. Um, in the city of Utrecht, it's over 50% of all passenger trips that are that involve a vehicle in, are on a bike. And people learn that because of these uh, films. I, I showed a still in the, in the presentation from a play, uh, 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 Mark Valkenboer, who, who's a Dutch person who makes um, uh, Bicycle Dutch, which is spreading the news on how this can be done worldwide. Now, I, I think a lot of people know that countries that have that really succeeded in the in the past at, at developing quickly were very often the countries that became students of other countries. Japan studied America in the 50s and 60s 
China studied America more in more recent decades. Western Europe studied America because America had the, the impressive economy of the mid to late 20th century. Well, I hope we can learn from that, that it's our turn now to learn from other countries uh, about how to get this right, which is why I had the example of the Netherlands to offer, um, though, of course, a great many others could be offered as well. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, next question here is from Michael Farrell, who says, this is an impressive show of disappointments and overly optimistic projections, but not all technological promises have been false. Do we really know that automated vehicles will never work as promised? It's a great question. And uh, as a historian, history teaches me to be humble. And because uh, you know I've studied too many forecasts of the past, that went ter that were completely wrong to have any confidence in myself as a forecaster of the future. So the first thing I will say is, actually, actually the first thing I'll say is the technology is unbelievably impressive. Machine learning is breathtaking. LIDAR is astounding. Um, the list goes on. Um, the question then becomes, what can it do for us? And if the question becomes, well, can it make cars work as a practical way to move people around in cities? I think we would be wise to be very skeptical for the reasons that cars, including the ones that the General Motors and all the others are showing us, have a substantial mass, low capacity. Uh, they require a lot of energy to move. Um, they, because of them having to moving quickly, uh, they have to move quickly or they won't attract paying customers. Um, for that reason, they also make it harder to get around by any other mode of transportation. And I think finally, we should be asking, is that a risk we want to take? Let's say it is theoretically possible. Cost to get there. I mentioned that experts say that about $100 billion has been spent on the autonomous vehicle future over the last 20 years. And so far, it can get you a Waymo ride in uh, Chandler, Arizona, and maybe it'll be able to get us some more things, but um, even then, you still have to make this a cost-effective proposition for the companies. To do that, they either have to charge passengers a lot, or they have to make them into massive entertainment centers so that we'll be as addicted to them as many of us as be have become addicted to our phones, and if that happens, we defeat the whole sustainability goal. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, next one here's from Rudy Vodica, who is uh, saying, with COVID, those who could work from home did. And as the virus seemed to be controlled here in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, traffic congestion has returned. So the experiment of remote working made strides, but did not remove the car from commuters' daily routines and employers' expectations. Perhaps the structure of cities and planning policies is as much a challenge, given that the nature of city growth has been premised upon road networks and individual automobile ownership. So my question is, how do we move from today's heavy investment in a pattern of city development where cars are enablers to in a reimagined future? That's a great question. Um, and it's interesting that cars have become enablers. And that's, that's a sign that we've created an environment in which you don't have good choices. So um, a car actually, you know, does give you freedom if you live in an environment where you can't do anything else. And I think if we want sustainability, if we want affordability, et cetera, uh, then we are going to have to change that. And we have something, a really powerful couple of allies in that effort. One is this can be framed as giving people choices. People like to hear that we, they're being offered a choice. Um, I think one of the things we can learn from the Netherlands is that that has worked there. In other words, people rate uh, driving in the Netherlands as the best country to drive in in the world. There's an app called Waze where drivers evaluate their drive and the highest rated drives in the world are in the Netherlands. And this signifies that they've created a country where people have good choices, which means that if you choose to drive, then you're choosing to drive on roads where the only other people on that road are there by choice. And that makes a big difference. Uh, in, for example, it means less congestion than you would otherwise have. So it can be framed as um, offering people choice. Um, it can also be uh, framed as 
cost saving because the least cost effective way of moving people ever invented was moving people around in as at one or two at a time in separate passenger cars we can uh you know give people who would like to do something less expensive a way to do it it will of course also take changing the fact that driving is artificially cheap it's subsidized in ways too numerous to list and that probably all of you already know anyway um and uh, so if if people paid the real cost of driving but had the choice of vastly less expensive modes of getting around then i think we could start to shift this but i, I have to work in the fact that it also takes learning from the futurama settler sellers the futurama sellers realized you have to depict an attractive future before you can sell that attractive future you have to depict it so people can see what's attractive about it and general motors was a genius at this so was ford so were other companies um, we need to get better if the advocates of a more sustainable future need to get better at depicting that future attractively which ought to be easy because it is an attractive future thanks peter uh, next question here is from Peter Conrad, who says, are there estimates of the infrastructure cost of preparing our street network for autonomous vehicles? My concern is that this will divert money from improvements such as complete streets. I share that concern emphatically. Now, to answer the question, there's been a kind of uh, a sine wave, uh, but I mean, it's it's been fluctuating up and down. So. If you remember Futurama 3, that's the smart highways, that was going to be basically all the roads. They, the cars would have to have some equipment, but the idea was that the roads would be the ones that really needed all the tech. The autonomous vehicle idea of the early 21st century came about in part because of the failure of that vision. They said, well, we can have dumb roads and smart cars and it will still work. Well, now we're seeing that pendulum swinging back again because increasingly, even the proponents of autonomous vehicles are saying we're going to need to have a lot of equipment out there sensors specially prepared roads even specially prepared cyclists and pedestrians so that the vehicles can reliably detect them so that th this means that it's not possible i think to offer a reliable cost estimate since the proponents themselves are fluctuating back and forth but there is no question that um, the even the, the public sector expenditures on this, apart from the technology in the roads, is already very high. The US Department of Transportation for several years at least has been putting a lot of money into research and development of autonomous vehicles uh, and into promoting them. I heard the uh, head of the Federal Highway Administration at the Autonomous Vehicles Symposium in 2019 say this technology is coming and it's our job in the Federal Highway Administration to enable that and to offer incentives to promote it. So, and that and that may be shifting, of course, under the current administration. I'm not real current on exactly where they see the technology, but the short version is that concern is exactly right. The cost of this, I think, is already diverting money from complete streets and other things that it would be better spent on. Okay, thanks, Peter. This is another longer one with some uh, preamble and comments. Um, this is from John Niles, who says, this is a very interesting presentation. But let me ask you about the concept of motorized personal mobility, of which the automobile is one version. Is motorized personal point-to-point uh, -point mobility the problem? No, no matter what the format, I'm thinking of the massive adoption of two-wheeled motorized personal mobility in the cities of Asia, at first gasoline-powered scooters and now transitioning to electric scooters. This is creating a traffic mess in Vietnam and Taiwan. But there's an interesting road space issue of intermixing two-wheelers with buses and delivery trucks. So is the problem personal motorized mobility in the hands of individuals and are electric bicycles some sort of fundamental solution with the range limitations covered by being able to take them aboard trains? Uh, that's a really interesting and important question with a lot going on in it. I, 
don't think I can give it the time it, it really deserves, but I can make a, a few quick observations. I want, it's very clear that two-wheeled mobility can create really uh, unpleasant situations, including situations that are hostile to people trying to walk, people trying to get to the bus. Uh, you, and, you know, uh, Vietnam is a case in point. You see this in Taipei uh, and lots of other places as well. Now, uh, the questioner put in the word solution for, say, electric bikes. And I want to, I think, history is very clear. There aren't solutions, and this is not a problem where we should be looking for solutions. There, there are kinds of problems that can be solved, and then there are kinds of problems where we manage them. A garden, for example, we manage the garden. If we try to sort of force it to be what we want it to be, we'll, we'll defeat it. Uh, same with uh, farming. Um, there's a Anywhere where there's a complex web, a network of interdependent nodes, when we try to sort of master any one node, we have problems on, on the others. Um, to get more specific to this question about making personal mobility work, making uh, the whole system work without the kind of chaos that you can find, say, in Hanoi, um, then uh, I again offer the example of the Netherlands. Uh, it's a good example for the USA because the values are similar. There, there's an individualistic country. There's a lot of, you know, even anti-vaxxers there and so on. Um, but uh, it's a country also where they've worked this out, to my impression, better than anywhere else. So, for example, um, one of the disadvantages about trains is you get off the train at your destination and you may have a dauntingly long walk, which may tempt you to call an Uber or something like that, or to get to the station uh, you may want to drive and then you may want to be able to park at the station. And if everybody wants to park at the station, you've got a kind of nightmare situation there. Well, in the Netherlands, uh, you can ride your bike to the station. They have parking garages that can handle tens of thousands of bikes. Uh, they're very seamlessly done. Um, they're publicly funded. You don't have to pay. And that's not because they're considered a charity, but rather because it's actually cost effective to do that because it takes cars off the road and it's more expensive to accommodate the cars than to make the bike garage. Then when you get to your destination, there's a public transport bike that you get with the same card you use to get the train and that you can use to get to your final um, destination. And incidentally, that train is all electric and it doesn't take massive batteries, which is one of the biggest problems about battery electric vehicles is the batteries for reasons I think you all know, not just having to do with range, but also having to do with sourcing the metals, the human conditions where the metals are sourced, the environmental conditions where the metals are sourced. And it turns out we can have electric mobility without batteries or without as many or as large batteries. But uh, the autonomous vehicle future that's being sold to us would be one where everybody would have to have uh, a large battery e either of their own or in the vehicle that is almost committed exclusively to them and that's a future with enormous uh, demands for lithium cobalt nickel and and the rest of the metals thanks peter um next question here is from michael farrell who says um, Bicycling is attractive to me for the same reason driving is attractive. It's direct and it provides nonstop trips to my destination on my own schedule. Plus in older cities, it's faster and cheaper to park a bicycle. Can transit compete or is it necessary to rebuild our cities to look like Holland first? Well, it's a shame we've gotten into the jam we've gotten into in the USA, which of course used to have good public transport say a hundred years ago because it's Re, uh, you know, profoundly expensive to restore that. Now, expensive is a relative uh, measure. And we should, of course, begin by recognizing that if supplying public transportation is expensive, supplying, uh, accommodating everybody in that transportation vehicle uh, with their own road capacity, even more expensive. So we have to keep that relative comparison we have that um, in mind. You now, it is clear that public transportation can thrive as soon as people are confident that it can get them, you know, they, have, they have good connectivity, can get them to a lot of just different destinations, can get them reasonably close to their destination, and is frequent enough to be convenient, and also where they'll know that the thing will actually show up 
technology can help, for example, by telling people even at the station, uh, at the bus station or the light rail station, whatever it is, when the next vehicle is coming, that can be a real uh, advantage. It can really encourage people to, to use them. That particular component is not so expensive as, as all the rest of the infrastructure is. Um, building that capacity back is not going to be easy, and I'm not here to claim that it will be easy. Um, it's going to be much better, though, than what we're still doing, frankly, in this country, which is trying to um, relieve everyone's delay as a driver in traffic by providing them with more road capacity. That is, you know, the least sustainable option. Thanks, Peter. And given the following volume of the questions, I'm going to ask you a couple more before we wrap. So we may go like five minutes over if that's okay. And thank you all again for submitting all these questions. Uh, we will share them with Peter afterward, and you also have an opportunity to contact him directly by his email, which is on the screen. Um, next question here is from Larry Shane, who says, we have become even more dependent on delivery vehicles for moving goods which increases the constituency for more roads. Is this a new part of the problem? Yes, uh, right. So, I mean, particularly as online retailing has supplanted to a large degree uh, brick and mortar retailing, you know, the, the volume of shipments is just enormous. Uh, many other versions of that as well. And um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I have the expertise to offer very much on that, except to say that um, there are some things that that are that look troubling that are being promised to us, like delivery by drone everywhere, which looks to be very energy intensive, among other limitations. Uh, and at the same time, we again have some very impressive examples, uh, particularly from countries where there have been more serious efforts than in this one to offer people alternatives to driving, where particularly in uh, Western Europe, we've been seeing a lot more distribution of goods, uh, particularly in the last shorter range delivery segment, like the final delivery to the customer uh, on the form in cargo bikes, electric cargo bikes, electric cargo bikes are amazing in what they can now do and what they are already doing. Um, those could serve a lot of local delivery purposes. Um, uh, what you know, we do need to do is find ways besides uh, shipping everything in um, right down to the last mile in large trucks, because as those trucks get emptied, their efficiency goes down. Um, but that's a, that's a tough one, and I don't think uh, I'll take more time to 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 uh, try to do that one justice. Okay, thank you. Um, Next question here is from Paul, who says, could future use of autonomous vehicles promote vehicle sharing for multiple trips per day per vehicle versus individually owned vehicles, which would reduce traffic congestions and the demand for on-site parking? Yes, yeah, so uh, you know, one of the things that's, that's behind promoting autonomous vehicles is that they're supposed to be more efficient. One of the reasons they're supposed to be more efficient is that many of them would be shared and then um, you know, one car could serve multiple people, um, just like a taxi does. I want to, first of all, question the term share. Very often that what's really meant is rented or in effect you're, you're, you're getting a driverless Uber uh, and there may be other people in it, but uh, this isn't quite sharing as, as the word means in everyday conversation. So I just think we should be a little bit skeptical about this use of the word sharing and also be a little bit skeptical about what's entailed. Namely, if the vehicle is, if you're paying the full cost of the ride, you're probably gonna be paying so much that it won't really serve many people's purposes. it will be like a high-end uh, luxury taxi. On the other hand, if it's affordable, it's probably going to be affordable because it'll be decked out with uh, high-tech entertainment that will be massively collecting and monetizing your data with the hope, as we've seen from the automakers and tech companies themselves, that this will induce us to spend more time in the vehicle, which is exactly the opposite of what we really need. Now, we went from a public transport model where public authorities were, uh, you know, made the deci major decisions about how they would be deployed we're increasingly depending on private companies to make these decisions. I think we should be questioning that trend 
because public authorities can make decisions, for example, on the basis of what constituencies of voters want, while as long as these decisions are being made by people who want to maximize um, revenue, uh, we may find ourselves on that consumer treadmill that Charles Kettering described back in 1929 as keep the consumer dissatisfied. Thanks, Peter. Just a couple more here. Uh, next one here is from Aaron Detter, who asked, can you give any examples of recent high social innova innovations that serve as low or no tech mobility solutions? Yeah, um, I don't want to be a broken record here, but the Netherlands is really setting the example there. So um, most people ride a bike or more bikes there than people. The, the share of passenger trips in Utrecht that's by bike is more than half. A very large and growing fraction of the bikes are electric, which really opens up bike mobility to a much bigger population for everyday practical purposes. Um, but that's that's low tech, but there's a lot of other low tech things that make a huge difference. This is why I mentioned shared space or what in England they call naked streets, where um, this is not a perfect thing by any means. There's plenty of limitations, but it seems to deliver a better experience for everybody uh, when we empower human smarts by taking away some of the automated controls, most of which are dumb. And rather than just figure out how to make all the, say, traffic signals super smart so that you, you never wait at a red light, why don't we just, at least in the denser areas, turn streets over to shared space? It works really well in the countries where it's been tried. It hasn't been tried so much in the US. Um, you know, Market Street in San Francisco, January 2020, before the pandemic, went largely to that model. And I've been on it, and it is a delight to use. It's very popular. It's a big success with the retailers along that way. Uh, it's also a way that people get to work because it has electric streetcars on it that offer practical service. So there are ways to do it. Thanks, Peter. And finally, from John Howard, I have a number of colleagues who live in rural areas and commute into a city because they like rural life. Are these the ideal candidates for autonomous cars or would autonomous cars enable more sprawl tendencies? There is definitely a high risk of exacerbating sprawl with autonomous vehicles simply for the reason that this amount of time you spend in the car is likely to feel less like it less burdensome and and for that reason you won't mind going much further and some people are very explicit that that's one of the attractions for them and that they might actually live further away with such a vehicle so yes there is that risk there's ways of averting that risk one one of the things is we've made instead of having a affordable housing policy we've had instead a highway system that gives you affordable housing by commuting further which is an absurdly inefficient way to get people affordable housing, right? So um, a lot of people, and this is true in my personal history as well, chose to live further from town because that's where we could get the affordable housing because the inner ring was surrounded by single family residences and, and you have to get past that to get to the affordable housing areas. Um, and so, uh, you know, Clearly, vehicles are more necessary in low-density rural areas, but we have to be careful that in trying to supply the needs of those areas that we don't continue to induce and exacerbate and, and subsidize uh, sprawl. We can counteract those effects. It would take things like limiting uh, single-family residence zoning, mixing it up a little bit so that mixed uses can enter in, and that way, those people who really do just live out in the country by preference uh, are a smaller population than live out in the country now, because a lot of the people who live out in the country now are living out there because that's where they can afford to live. Great, thanks, Peter. Well, we could easily go on another half an hour with all the questions and comments. So I appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to give us some closing thoughts for our audience. Well, uh, a closing thought would be uh, we, we are being presented constantly with what the future is. Here's the future. Here's the future we're going toward. Uh, here's the future uh, in store for you. And um, I 
urge, I know I don't have to tell planners that this, but I think the population needs to be asked, what future do you want? And that's not a question you just ask cold because we grow up in environments that influence what we think of as possibilities. And we need imaginative people and particular planners who can depict for us what our possibilities are should we, if we actually exercise our choice um, so that in effect, we'll be getting a menu. Uh, I'd like to see us, uh, I as a citizen would like to see planners presenting us with a menu and saying, you know, do you like bike lanes here? Do you like this there? Do you really prefer to drive in this situation? Instead, what we're getting uh, from Autonorama is here's the future and get ready for it. Great, thank you, Peter. Thanks for being with us again today. My so with that, we're going to thank you. With that, we're going to conclude our webinar today. Autonorama, the illusory promise of high tech driving. I'd like to offer a great big thank you to Peter Norton for a great presentation, to everyone who attended today, and to John Coleman, our communications and technology guru, who helps to make this all happen. The complete recording of today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org. Also, for those who have requested one, all attendees will receive an email that will contain a link to a personalized certificate of participation. Please look for this follow-up email if you need the certificate to claim other continuing education credits. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. And finally, keep an eye on smartgrowth.org and your email inbox for details on future webinars. Uh, this will be our last one of 2021. We thank you for attending this webinar and all of our webinars in 2020 and 2021. With that, we'll see you again next year.